2003 was a year best described by cynicism and disillusion at a level that not even Lord of the Rings Return of the King could prevent. The USA and its newfound allies invaded Iraq under false pretense, declaring mission accomplished a month later, leaving thousands of civilians dead and yet still being involved in the ground war there for over a decade, leading to a total destabilization of the area and an erosion of the concept that you needed a valid reason to invade a country. The Concorde, the supersonic jet that was just being shown to the public when this series started, flew for the last time. Limited usability due to many sonic booms, high costs and massive technical failures that led to tragedies and grounding the concept. There would be no more supersonic commercial flights. That year, a tragedy that many dread would happen again was seen in the failure of the Columbia Space Shuttle. It broke up on re-entry, leading to the death of its occupants, the second space shuttle to be destroyed while in use. Hopes of a return to space exploration were dwindling. Heat waves reached an all-time high in some regions, 5,000 people being killed by high temperature in France, an earthquake would claim the lives of over 40,000 people in Iran, SARS would claim hundreds of lives in Southeast Asia, and the fear of an outbreak of a deadly avian flu were on the rise, leading many to panic. It seemed like a gloomy, terrible, horrible time to live in. They even stopped making the classic Volkswagen Beetle that year. New World Computing and Black Isle were shut down. But it wasn't all bad, was it? Somewhere out there I was enjoying Diablo 2 in the comfort of my own home, Obsidian Entertainment was founded and China launched its first manned space mission, the Shenzhou 5. In 2003 we got at Skype and the Safari browser, WordPress and the H.264 codec, the prototype for the Blu-ray standard was released, being the last optical drive developed to date and probably ever. And AMD brought us the first 64-bit CPUs that were actually worth a damn, with a bump in performance that put Intel's Pentium 4 to shame leading to many years of anti-competitive practices and downright bribes from Intel to maintain its slipping grasp on market dominance. Until, you know, it started making actually better CPUs. This was when they stopped making the classic Famicom and Super Famicom consoles. They were apparently still in production somewhere even in that year. They even stopped making the Nintendo Game Boy and Game Boy Color. And the new contender entered the space of mobile gaming in the form of Nokia. It had a novel idea. What if we mix a phone with a game console? Thus, the Engage was born coming with games like The Elder Scrolls Travels and not truly ever really being all that successful. Yes, it did sell 2 million units, but in this field it was outpaced by just about everything and technologically it was primitive compared to the PlayStation Portable prototype showcased by Sony that very year. But probably the biggest thing to come out of 2003 in terms of gaming adjacency was a thing called Steam. Valve, the studio that brought us Half-Life and Counter-Strike, replaced the multiplayer infrastructure of all its games with a thing called Steam and let you buy games through it, actually. This wasn't a new concept. You could buy software and games through online distribution for some time. Stardock Central, the predecessor to Impulse, already being two years old old by then, and it wasn't going to do a lot this year, but oh boy, would things change in a few months. So onto the video games themselves, where it was a year of disillusion as well, in a way, because of games like Enter the Matrix that had so much promise to it being made at the same time as the movies, and yet was a disaster that managed to take a great concept like the one we saw in the first Matrix and drive it into the ground as much as the movie sequels did as well. Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness managed to bury Lara Croft better than killing her off dead in Tomb Raider 4, and in the process it sunk core design as well, leading to a disappearance of the series for a few years allowing new action-adventure games to take the stage. Deus Ex Invisible War came with the promise of continuing the fantastic ideas of the exceptional Deus Ex and managed to underdeliver to the point where some fans of the series would like to pretend that it does not exist. And yet, there was still positivity around, since a lot of these games made and published and released this year 
were produced when the world was a more cheerful, brighter place without the grim darkness of the future where there is only war. But make no mistake, the bleakness and cynicism of that period would ingrain itself into games that are now being developed that were now being thought out. But now wasn't then, at least not yet. 2003 brought us one of the most beautiful fairy tales ever put on screen. What controls attached to it, I mean. And best of all, it came in the form of a reimagination, a reboot if you will. One with none of the negativity or drawbacks currently associated with the concept of one of the most beautiful games made in the early early 90s. That game was Ubisoft Montreal's Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, created under the supervision of Jordan Mechner, the creator of the series himself. A game that brought the cinematic approach to designing a game to a whole new level with magnificent visuals, fluid movement and fantastic new mechanics tied to it. Max Payne may have brought us bullet time and its sequel that came out that year may have slightly tweaked it, but Sense of Time brought us time reversal. Made a mistake? Turn back time. Fell off a ledge in this action platformer often with a fixed camera, turn back time. Died because of a trap, turn back time. Got killed by an enemy, turn back time. Thus fulfilling the request of the band Aqua that in 1997 asked if only I could turn back time. Well now you could. The power wasn't unlimited and unlike Max Payne's bullet time, it was a part of the story and the setting. It was perfectly integrated. And the mechanic would find a home in many other video games, especially those where an error of a split second could ruin minutes of work, where saving a game in the process of playing it wouldn't really work, like in the racing genres. Sands of Time was a landmark title, building upon both the original Prince of Persia and all the progress that the now dead Tomb Raider series did with 3D platforming in the action-adventure genre. They also came out with Michel Ancel's Beyond Good and Evil, a game that underperformed considerably in terms of sales, ending up bundled with cheese just so it could generate some money, but it was a critical dark and it built up quite a following over the years, thanks to its great music and very interesting setting. Gameplay wise it was uh, well something came out a year later that made it look like not all that much, though that one is kind of forgotten and Beyond Good and Evil is getting a sequel someday. I could probably make a category just for the Star Wars games released this year. Since the new movies were topping the charts in spite of being bloody awful, there were games being made by the bucket load every year and a lot of them were great. Jedi Academy finally let you dual wield or carry a dual lightsaber. Knights of the Old Republic showed us what Bioware can do when they stretch their muscles beyond Dungeons and Dragons and into a new field that lets them explore new ideas and just about the same character archetypes and plot lines they've always used because that's how they work. In spite of that, it was still at its time and it still is now one of the best games the company has ever made and a great RPG in its own right in spite of it treating the lightsaber like just another glowing stick. A mistake that many many games that weren't part of the Jedi Knight series had made over the years, but it was the story and the richness it brought to the setting that truly made this game shine. It made Star Wars interesting again in a time when you've seen the prequels, there is no need to say more. Speaking of movie adaptations, in 2003 we got Tron 2.0, letting you visit the world of Tron that we saw two decades ago in the movie by the same name brought to life in a sequel to the movie that blended some new ideas with the classic games that were already established as existing in that game's world. A world where electronic entities, programs, lived in cyberspace as if they were alive and where humans could enter, like a matrix or like a metaverse if you will, a digital habitat, which was the same idea that Second Life had. This was not really a game in the traditional sense, much like Habitat wasn't really one at its core. Second Life was a virtual world where real people could lead virtual lives controlling virtual characters with virtual assets but interacting with real people and sometimes even spending real money and earning it at the same time because this was something new. Well truthfully no, Habitat predated it and a lot of MMOs tried to do this and it was sort of promised to us a long time ago. It was the fulfillment of that promise of living in cyberspace. The one we've read about in books like Neuromancer and books like Snow Crash. Now sure, due to technical limitations, it wasn't all that all-encompassing and immersive as something like the metaverse described by Neil Stevenson in Snow Crash, but it 
was more evolved than a simple online chat screen or a simple MMO where human interaction is at best an unintended consequence. That was actually one of the main ideas of a lot of MMOs that came out that year. Even Myst got in on the act with Myst Online or Live. But you'd see it better in games like Planetside, an MMO FPS with a lot of head scan weapons on account of a dial up modem not being up to snuff for ballistic calculations. But it was still a game where you'd be fighting not alone and not against some NPCs, but along with other people, grouped into three factions against other people in a massive, continent-spanning, never-ending war for dominance. And it wasn't just about shooting people, it was about driving, it was about piloting, learning to do those things, it was about logistics and combat tactics, it was Star Siege tribes taken to a whole new persistent level, and it would last a long time. Sony Online Entertainment would close it down eventually, but the sequel is still going strong. And that wasn't the only MMO the company put out that year. There was also Star Wars Galaxies, a game born out of the refusal of Electronic Arts to make a Wing Commander MMO that went far beyond being a simple game about gathering loot from fallen enemies. It was about creating a community. Players had the ability to build homes and then form those homes into a city that was run by them that had elections, a political system, rudimentary but still was there, and you could interact with others not just purely as a combat class. You had classes that weren't really focused on that, could be used for combat but still you had the ability to be a dancer. It was more in line with what Ultima Online tried to do but expanded in a way, maybe not offering the same kind of flexibility since this was 3D and not 2D, but it was a glimpse of a game that could have been one of the greatest MMOs ever made had an event not occurred quite soon that torpedoed Star Wars Galaxies forever. And if the Star Wars universe wasn't large scale enough for you, then a small studio from Iceland created a game that would be essentially the murderer of every space MMO ever made. And it would serve to maintain the sandbox style of MMO in its own way. That game was EVE Online, one of the largest and most expensive MMOs ever made, or at least the one that has fit the largest amount of people in one place at the same time without the servers bursting into flames. EVE Online does have PvE elements, it's not all about PvP, but it is more about interacting with other people instead of blowing up their ships. The story is driven by this interaction between people on their own, by intrigue that they form, by drama that they generate, by committing to play it with more dedication than some people would put into work or family. It was, without a doubt, an absolute landmark of an MMO that managed to hold out in spite of some serious competition both online and offline in the form of things like Egosov's Grand X2 The Threat, a space sim so vast that in the endgame you would be playing mostly an RTS business simulator and mowing down entire sectors with your fleet of carriers, provided you spent a lot of time actually gathering money for that. But in the online space there was one other supermassive game released that year, Maple Story. It came out in Japan and South Korea. A 2D game that you may not think much of, seeing as how it looks very simplistic, but why is its game would go on to be arguably probably the most successful MMO ever made. Some numbers put it at over 90 million players. Now I'm not entirely sure if the number is right, but it is still quite impressive. If that was too much for you, then there was always Multi Theft Auto, a community attempt to add a multiplayer mode to GTA 3, one that started from very humble beginnings, letting people play together in LAN or in small networks, but would eventually end up evolving into a much better multiplayer mode than Rockstar ever managed to create in the years following its release. And most importantly, as long as you had the PC version of the game, it was free. Same as Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, an excellent multiplayer FPS set in World War II that was free, but was released maybe a few years too late since it came out at the same time as Call of Duty, 
one of the hallmarks of the FPS genre combining both a great multiplayer mode and a great single player game as well with a heavy focus on the authenticity of the experience as seen through the lens of movies like Saving Private Ryan with exhilarating set pieces and the feeling that this was real war. It would plant seeds for some ideas that would be kind of counterintuitive to uh, well, check out Battlefield 5's nonsense with face paint but still it was a great game. In the coming decade, it alone would sell over 5 million copies, which is virtually nothing compared to any of its sequels. As we end 2003, it's probably worth mentioning a few other games. Command and Conquer found its way again with Generals, a game that wasn't about time travel or alien resources, but about terrorism and national security. It was a bit of a theme back then. It also didn't hurt that no matter what theme it had, the basic gameplay was great. Another series that would find renewed vigor was Need for Speed, taking influence from the emerging trend of tuner cars and underground racing cultures and the recent Fast and the Furious movie, Black Box Studio brought us Need for Speed Underground, one of the most successful titles in the series, dwarfing every other game that came before it probably combined and establishing a new style, one that was more about attitude than it was about the cars themselves. People loved it. And its selection of music widened from the classic techno beats of the past to stuff that actually had lyrics. Though to be fair, Hot Pursuit 2 also had them, but Underground soundtrack is quite a bit more famous. Reminding us in some places of what GTA, but most of all Tony Hawk's Pro Skater did with its own soundtrack. Postal 2 also came along and although it is considered by many as being a very very violent game, Running with Scissors managed to create a title that was more about the opportunity of you playing it as either a violent sociopath or as a pacifist, since it let you get around pretty much every obstacle for a long time without ever being violent, which is more than most action games ever did. And yet people would still point fingers at Postal for being, well Postal 2 for being violent. The polar opposite was true for Rockstar's Manhunt, that was all about being obligated to kill in the most gruesome and murderous ways possible. It was spectacle above all else. Dota All-Stars was released as well that year, being now based on the Eternal Frost expansion of Warcraft 3 and becoming the basis upon which, well, I think I've said it last year as well, one of the most popular games today is built upon. Zuma was released for people that were already getting bored of Bejeweled at the office. And for fans of leering at scantily clad video game characters, there came a spin-off of a fighting series in the form of Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball that focused only on the female characters of the game playing volleyball and generally posing very provocatively. There have been accusations that the series is mostly just soft corn pornography. The accusations are not wrong. As for what was the game of 2003? I would say it was Prince of Persia The Sands of Time. In a year that had a lot of unfortunate events in it, it became a very good refuge for people that wanted to return to a simpler time with clear definitions between good and evil with no cynicism, just earnest whimsy and charm. And it didn't hurt that it was a really good game that set new standards for platformers, for action, for cinematic storytelling, for presentation in general. It was, and still is, a superb game. So we close another year. Next week we welcome a few new legends and titans to the world of gaming. Ones that still reign high above us all and remind us that they still have not been surpassed. Goodbye.